energy sources. That's the topic for today. And what I mean by energy sources is mostly, well, harvesting sources. Not really your batteries or your uh, AC adapters or things like that. <clears throat> but it, it should be clear why we need an energy source. Because any electronic circuit consumes electrons, energy. It is the um, voltage that we place across the electronic circuits that makes it possible to change between the one and the zero that makes it possible to amplify signals. It is this difference in Fermi levels that we call a voltage that allows electrons to flow. And that difference in potential has to come from somewhere. And there are many different sources. Now, it's good to realize that when it comes to batteries, uh, those can store quite a bit of energy. I mean, we can drive our cars <laughs> on lithium-ion batteries. But if you actually want to sort of live for a long time on a battery, there is a limit to how much energy you can consume. For um, one year, you're limited to about um, 45 microwatts per cubic centimeter. So given a cubic centimeter, let's see, camera, camera, well, I guess that's something like that in a cube. Then for the battery, the, the maximum you can consume is about 45 micrograms or more microwatts. For a lot, much longer time span, 10 years, you have to drop that current or power consumption even further down there is an inherent self-discharge in batteries that probably makes it not possible to run for 10 years on a lithium-ion battery. But what if we wanted to run for a long time? What if we actually wanted to make electronics that ran forever without a battery or without changing a battery? How could we do it? What are the sources that are available to us for a, an energy that we can convert into a voltage or a current? So what you're looking at now, and you'll find the link in the lecture notes, is a diagram that sort of shows the different forms, a couple of different forms of energy. You have the electrical fields, the voltages at the top here. We have mechanical stress. We have temperature. And between these modes of energy, there are ways to convert, could convert between them. So we can go from a mechanical stress into an electric field. That is, uh, for example, the piezoelectric effect. We can go from a temperature or a difference in temperature into electric fields. There are many, many ways to sort of change energy. You can never change energy with 100% efficiency, so you will always lose energy when you modify from one form to another form, but it can be relatively efficient. And what I wanna show you today is what type of circuits do you actually need to make in order to leverage the different energy harvesting techniques. Now, it should be, maybe it's not obvious. <laughs> Hopefully after this lecture, it will be obvious that there are limits to how much energy you can actually consume if you plan to be based on energy harvesting. So if you, if you wanna run your laptop on energy harvesting, well, you need a pretty big solar cell or you need a pretty, pretty big sort of uh, system in order to capture enough energy because we're talking about 100 watts. If we go down to sort of the um, smart cards or NFC cards, near field communication cards, then maybe that they're running off microamps. And in that case, you can actually harvest completely the energy. 
And in between there, we have technologies like Bluetooth, which is used for, well, most things like this, and uh, could be used in switches and so on, where the energy is still, during peak current consumption, or peak power consumption, is on the order of tens of milliwatts. But the average current consumption can be approaching the tens of microwatts, and maybe even approach one microwatt. Now, you probably have and you have seen calculators based on solar cells, quite small solar cells that sometimes work indoors, and they will be on the order of one microwatt. But depending on how much energy you need, you will also be limited in the type of harvesting technique that can, you can use, whether it's mechanical or uh, thermal gradients or indeed photons from the sun or, <laughs> stupidly, photons from um, your Wi-Fi router, which is really, 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 really low energy. You have to sort of pick and choose. And, and, and it also means that you cannot use the same harvesting circuit for all the, all the different modalities. A capture circuit for a thermal, thermal gradient will be different from a piezoelectric circuit. What we're showing here now is different techniques. And, well, different techniques, different wireless standards. The wireless standards that is possible to run on energy harvesting, it probably is limited. So, the wireless standards like uh, Wi-Fi <laughs> or indeed cellular is going to be quite hard to run on a energy harvesting system because they consume watts. And they, they do give long range though. But when we're talking about sort of uh, Bluetooth or Bluetooth low energy, it is starting to be become possible to actually run it on harvesting circuits. It is possible to go battery-less. So the uh, modal modalities that I want to cover today are um, thermoelectric, photovoltaic, piezoelectric, electromagnetic, and triboelectric. And all these will have slightly different circuits. I'll try to explain, well, at least what I understand of how the energy can be harvested and how the actual difference in voltage or current flow actually occurs. What you're looking at now is a thermoelectric generator. It is using the difference in temperature to generate a voltage difference. The setup that we need is, in this case, you need uh, some iron wire, you need some copper wire, which is the orange one, and you need a heat source. And the way I understand what happens in this system is that, well, at the hot end, you can consider the electrons in the um, metal as kind of like a, a gas. It's a gas, electron gas. And at the hot end, <laughs> the electrons will move at a higher energy. Higher energy. They will move um, faster, maybe scatter more. And they will have a higher energy state. Now, it's kind of like a gas, I think, that at the hot end, you'll get a maybe a less dense <laughs> electron gas. Or maybe it's because the mobility of electrons is actually lower at hot temperatures. So you get a difference in charged electrons between the cold end and the hot end. Now, if you only had an iron wire then you'd sort of have an electron distribution and there will be continuous current from the hot end to the cold end. But if you had, if this uh, orange wire was a, was an iron wire, then there wouldn't be any voltage difference between the two ends. But it turns out that the, the sort of um, difference in electrons that you get as a function of temperature between a hot, and a hot end and a cold end, that depends on the material.
So if we have two different materials with different coefficients for this uh, difference in, in, well, it's a difference in voltage really, then we can actually leverage the fact that there will be a voltage difference between the iron at the top here and the copper at the bottom. And the more sort of more of these that you have, these wires going from the hot to cold and so on, the higher the voltage will be. The effect is called the Seebeck coefficient. And you can go to Wikipedia and you can find details or more details on how that works. But it's basically this voltage difference that you get as a function of temperature in a material. And one thing to note is that the microvolts per Kelvin is actually quite low. So what you're looking at now is actually a plot of the Seebeck coefficients for different materials. So we have gold, we have copper, we have aluminum, and wolfram, and don't remember what PD was. And you can also see that it changes with temperature. But <clears throat> when we then have a hot end and a cold end and a configuration that looks like this with a couple of different metals, it is possible to extract a voltage. The voltage will be quite low though. A similar principle actually occurs in silicon. And it turns out that the Seebeck coefficient, this uh, in this case millivolts per Kelvin, that depends on the location of the Fermi level inside the silicon. So depending on whether you dope with acceptors or donors, you can change the Seebeck coefficient. So we can notice that if the Fermi level is in the middle, so in, well, what we're looking at now is, let's see, conductivity on the blue and the Fermi level between the valence band on the bottom side here and the conduction band on the right side. So valence band on the left side, conduction band on the right side. And in the middle, we have intrinsic silicon. So in intrinsic silicon, you will not have a Seebeck coefficient. But as you change the doping, you change the conductivity conductivity, and you also change the Seebeck coefficient. And the interesting thing happens when you go, for example, with a P-doped system, so you're doping with uh, acceptors, and you have a Fermi level that's at this point <laughs> in relation to the valence band, you can see that we have relatively high conductivity, and we have a positive Seebeck coefficient. Now, with, if we dope with acceptors, shifting the um, Fermi level close to the, valent, uh, close to the conduction band, then we get a negative Seebeck coefficient. So that means that if you have a silicon material where you heat it, you can actually get a flow of electrons and holes. And that's pretty cool. So if you heat one side, on the other side, there will be a voltage difference and we can leverage that voltage difference. Now, the voltage difference is really, really small. And also the cool thing with uh, silicon is that can, you can actually run this process in reverse. If you apply a voltage, you can actually cool the other side. Now, this is called a Peltier element. It's a similar, uh, similar type of technique. These... Um, Thermoelectric generators have been used for many, many years. It is the power source that is used in the Voyager probes. And what you're looking at now is the Voyager probe. And you can see the thermoelectric generator at the bottom here. This is what's called a um, nuclear battery. So you have some isotopes inside that naturally de decay and that generate heat. And outside that heat source, you have these thermoelectric generators, like these ones, that convert from a heat differential. So a heat hot side and a cold side. The cold side would be the one that is radiating into space, where you can actually get then a certain amount of voltage difference. I think actually for the Voyager, it's significant amount of power. I don't remember ex exactly the number, whether it was uh, 100 watts or something like that. I don't remember. Let's see. Yeah, <laughs> actually it was. About 160 watts. So that's that's quite a lot. But of course, then you are bringing radioactive material 
so it's actually 238 plutonium. Is it 238 or 235? Uh, 238, 238, 235 is the one that's uh, used for bombs, I think. Anyway. <laughs> you don't have to have a... Uh, you don't have to have a nuclear source. You can have any voltage differential. And, the, and no, sorry, any temperature differential, and you can apply these thermoelectric generators, and you can buy these uh, at DigiKey. The challenge with the thermoelectric generators is that the voltage across them is usually quite low. You can put multiple in series, but that increases the size, of course. But usually it's sort of 1 to 50 millivolts per Kelvin volt, uh, temperature difference. So for example, if you wanted to do the temperature difference between my arm and air, that's maybe my arm's probably around 33 degrees Celsius, maybe. And while well, the ambient here is uh, maybe 23 degrees inside Celsius inside this room, which means that there's only, well, 10 degrees difference between the hot and cold side. Now, that means that the, at the sort of lower end, I would only get 10 millivolts out from that. And 10, 10 millivolts is too low, really, to run any electronic circuits on, because we need about two or three thermal voltages, 26 millivolts, in order to do anything. The really nice thing about a nice thing, yeah, it is really nice with thermoelectric generators. If you have this temperature difference, then and you can sort of run on that really low voltage, then you can actually pull quite a lot of current because they have internal resistance of about 10 ohms. So that's 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 significant current that you can pull, which is why you can get up to 100 watts. <laughs> Although probably the temperature difference in the Voyager is a bit higher. So it should be possible to harvest quite a bit of energy, provided you have the them temperature difference and you need that temperature difference. The There is actually one thing that I, I would recommend as a student project, and that is to, to make oscillators work at ultra low voltages. Because if I have a thermoelectric generator, I can actually boost the voltage, provided I have a clock source. If I have a clock source, if I have switches that work at this low, well, actually, if I have a clock source, then I can pretty much generate a higher voltage from a low voltage. But I need an oscillator, I need a clock source in order to boost. So running a ring oscillator or whatever type of oscillator at, let's say, maybe two thermal voltages, 50 to, 50 to 100 millivolts, if that's possible, then that would be really cool. That would be a really nice project. So, yeah, that's something you could work on if you wanted to. Photovoltaic is a slightly different way of generating energy. What we're doing in a photovoltaic is we have a PN junction. We have the uh, N-doped side with uh, donors. We have the P-doped side with acceptors. There is a voltage differential across the de depletion region. And in the depletion region, there is really no mobile charges. All the charges are locked into place. There is very few electrons and holes in the depletion region. On the N side, the electrons are the majority carrier, so there's mostly electrons, but there are still holes. And the same on the P side. Now there is a continuous exchange of minority carriers across the N and P N junction. Now interesting things can happen if you introduce some sort of photons into the silicon, especially if the photons have high enough energy, so the energy is given by h times the frequency, where h is Planck's constant, as long as the energy is high enough to actually give enough energy to electrons in the valence band to jump into the conduction band, you can free up electron hole pairs. Now, in while this is used in reverse, rever, reverse in uh, photodiodes, and when we transmit light, then we usually need a direct band gap type of uh, material. While I think you can make solar cells also based on 
indirect band gap, which is like silicon. Anyway, if you get photons into the depletion region, which is what I've tried to illustrate at the bottom here, then you can release an ele electron hole pair. And if those, well, the electron will see the field, both of them will see the field actually across the, across the depletion region, and the electron will travel to the N side, and the hole will travel to the P side. Now, if you knock out electron hole pairs in the P side, then <clears throat> here you don't necessarily have a field inside the P side. The, the, all the field inside the P injunction is across the actual depletion region. But the electrons will diffuse around. And if the electron diffuse and it gets, gets close to the field, uh, in the depletion region, it will be slept, swept across and thus contribute to current. And the same for the N side. If you get electron hole pairs generated on the N side and you get you don't recombine in immediately and the hole gets close to the depletion region, well, then it can travel across the depletion region. What we end up with is if we, tr if we track the direction of holes in this case, we can see that hole here at three that travels over and from B to A. And B to A is in what's well, in the top figure here. And the same for the bottom hole travels from B to A. That means that we are getting a photocurrent that travels from B to A. Is that correct? Yes, <laughs> that is correct. Okay, so we're getting a photocurrent. This is the photocurrent that goes in reverse direction of the diode. That means that at a certain point, well, the voltage across the diode, this photodiode, will actually be de be a combination. Well, it be determined by the photocurrent that we have and the load current. So if we set up the diode equation, we can figure out what the ID is. That's just the uh, diode current. That's the difference between the photo current minus the load current. And we can figure out what the, uh, the diode voltage is. And then we can figure out what is the power consumption or what's the power consumption in the load. Because for, for photodiodes, it turns out that in order to extract most energy, you actually need to operate at the right load current. So if I, in this case, I, I just made a model of the equations and I've plotted the diode voltage as a function of the load current. So naturally, if the load current exceeds the photocurrent, then the voltage across the diode is zero because there's no current going into the diode. All the current goes to the, um, to the load. But if it's slightly below, then I get a relatively high voltage on the diode. And at the same time, I get a relatively high current. And this optimum power point that actually moves with the amount of light. So any real photodiode system will inc include a, well, any harvesting circuit for a solar cell should include a optimum power point tracker. And you can actually see on the uh, data sheet for, uh, from any solar here, this is one sort of typical solar cell thing. We can see current density milliamps per that centimeter squared. It sort of has an optimum at, what is this? Yeah, it's around 40 milliamps per um, centimeter squared. And then the voltage is about 0 0.5. So that's sort of the optimum power point that you want to track. So in 
papers, and I have provided a link here. You can find details on how to to sort of track this optimum power point, because that means that the voltage or the current, I would should say, that you want to pull from the solar cell, that actually depends on the lighting conditions. So you need to track that continuously. Now that means that the load current you put from pull from the solar cell should be maybe maybe it's more than you need in your system which means that you'll put your your um, harvested energy into some sort of storage device. Might be a battery or might be a capacitor, supercapacitor, or something like that. Piezoelectric effect. Well, this is funny. Um, I think I've understood this, but I'm not entirely sure. I think the explanation goes something like this. Consider that you have a what's called a polar material. Uh, I think gallium was it gallium nitride. Let's see. I put it in the lecture notes. Uh, let's see. Go to the lecture notes. Energy sources. Most of the stuff I say is also in the lecture notes. I just wanted to check that I get the uh, material right. So gallium nitride. Yeah. So in gallium nitride, it is actually a unit cell that is what's called polar. So if we look at the unit cell here, let's do asymmetric, I guess. So the, the minimum possible unit that is gallium nitride is this unit cell here. And let's see, if I uh, exp extend it into multiple, can we zoom in? It's a bit easier to see for you guys. Yeah. So what you're looking at now is gallium nitride. And it turns out in gallium nitride, it's possible to get a slight polarization of the uh, orbitals, which means that, well, <laughs> the, the actual unit cell has a dipole. There's a plus side and a, and a minus side that con can contribute to an electric field. Now normally in a insulator the the crystal structure will be what's it called uh, amorphous it sort of be random uh, chunks of crystal um, not in a particularly ordered form. Now in that sort of random orientation of uh, unit cell or domains, they're called uh, crystal domains, then all these different polarities of the unit cell actually don't really accumulate. But it's possible if you heat it up, heat up the material, and you apply an electric field, you can get all these polar moments of the domains to align. And you can actually make it such that there is an inherent dipole. <laughs> there is an inherent sort of all the dipoles of the units of the uh, unit cells and the domains add up into there will be electric field across the material. Now these amorphous crystals are usually quite high resist. It's not really a crystal, but amorphous materials are very high resistive but even high resistance will will sort of eventually if there's a potential across will will um, equalize such that um, at some point there is no longer a potential because the whatever free electrons there are will travel through the material and equalize the potential however if you then apply stress so physically change the distances in the material. Now you're sort of shifting the electric fields because you're moving the dipoles. And the free charges that are sort of compensated for the built-in, or not built-in electric field, but this electric field created by the dipoles, that is no longer entirely correct. <laughs> it's not cancelling uh, the moved electric field. And now what you'll have is for a brief moment, you'll have a voltage across the material. Now, eventually that voltage will dissipate. But if you continue to add mechanical stress, 
you can actually extract an AC current from piezoelectric materials. Apparently it's also possible to, to pre-charge the material to a certain voltage, such that um, you can actually have, for a little while, kind of like a DC uh, field, a DC um, current. But most of the piezoelectric elements will be AC based. So that's why you need mechanical vibrations, because you need this changing of the, of the dipoles in the unit cells and the accumulation of those, uh, all those electric fields. You need a change in those in order to get a change in voltage. Hopefully that was slightly coherent <laughs> and understandable. If not, try read the lecture notes. And if that's not understandable, well, then comment below and I'll try to make it clear. And maybe, maybe you be know better than me. And if you do, please let me know on the comments below. Anyway, what for certain is that the piezoelectric elements are sort of this AC voltage source. You have an AC voltage source and there's a certain capacitance. So the capacitance in this case, that would sort of be a short. <laughs> uh, a, a, the AC current source, really, that will develop a voltage across the capacitance and that's it's that AC voltage that we can extract. In these uh, rectifiers, you, you need some sort of way to turn it from AC into DC and, well, look in the papers for how they, they do that. Uh, one example is in this link. I think that's not public domain. No, it's not. But have a look. It's one of the ones I um, thought looked cool. <laughs> now, electromagnetic. Well, for, well, I guess most of us, <laughs> maybe not all of us, all of us, but most of us will have a phone, a smartphone. I have a pretty old iPhone 13. That has NFC charging. So inside here, on the back side, there is a coil. There is an inductor. That inductor I can simply place inside my car or on other charging chi, I think it's a chi standard. I can place it there and somehow get energy transfer. Now, the near field communication that, well, this antenna is actually quite similar to the near field communication antenna. I think it might actually be the same antenna. That operates it in what we call the um, near field or the uh, reactive near field or the inductive near field. Now that inductive near field is actually a fraction of the wavelength. So you take the wavelength and then you divide by two pi and that's roughly the sort of uh, realm of influence of this inductive near field. What's cool is that as long as you place an antenna in that inductive near field, so if I have my reader coming in and getting close to the phone, then it turns out that you can actually sense the impedance of that antenna. And that's how NFC communication works. You sort of change the load on, for example, <laughs> I have my cards, my uh, normal pay cards. I get close to them and you can actually sense that it's connected because it can sense the, it can sense the impedance of the antenna in the cards. The point is that this type of transfer can get quite good efficiency, but you do have to be quite close. So and you have to operate at a relatively low frequency. So it turns out that Qi seems to operate at 205 uh, kilohertz. And that means that you can actually go inductive quite far, but uh, normal NFC communication is operating at 13.56 um, megahertz, which means that you have an inductive field quite far out. This is why, for example, that you can actually detect the cards, the payment cards that you have, I'm not going to show you that, by the way, because that has my account number on it, <laughs> um, from a certain distance, if you have a sensitive, a sensitive antenna. 
There is also an air fuel standard that is also operating at pretty low frequency, and all these use sort of the inductive um, near field. At higher frequency, so at Bluetooth frequency, this inductive near field is only really, really a very few centimeters. And you can actually see it when you have a dev kit and you, you put your hand very close to the antenna. Let me demonstrate. So if I have my dev kit and I actually touch the region around the antenna and I observe the RSSI, I will be ever able to see my finger. And sort of when I get inside a few centimeters, maybe even a bit further out also because of the, uh, I'm uh, approaching this radiative uh, Fresnel zone. Anyway, those type of harvesting circuits, NFC, operating and chi, chi are all operating with AC fields. They're setting up a constant carrier kind of, and you can harvest energy from that. So you need rectifiers. Now, there is another way to operate based on the electromagnetic spectrum. So <clears throat> there are many people and standards that think it's a good idea to do ambient RF harvesting. The idea goes something like this. In the world around me, there is phones, there is Wi-Fi routers, there are a bunch of these transmitters of energy that are used for communication. What if we could harvest that energy? Wouldn't that be great? Because it's sort of ambient, it's there. And in principle, it sounds nice, and people are working on it. But I fundamentally think it's a stupid idea. <laughs> and here's why. So it may work, but it's probably one of the more inefficient ways of harvesting energy. So actually transmitting energy. At some point, you actually have to make the energy. Now, when it's coming from the sun, fine. We have, an, we have a nuclear reactor up in the sun. We have a continuous fission bomb, I guess is a better word. A continuous hydrogen bomb in the sky. And it's going to burn for quite a long time. Now, that, that, that energy is fine to harvest. But if we want to use RF harvesting on Earth, then we have to generate that, transmit that signal from somewhere. Transmit the power. Now, if you're transmitting from Wi-Fi a Wi-Fi router, then it's not a lot of power. It's around 20 dBm. And if you're not familiar with the dBm scale, what I've done here is to put in the different numbers. You have uh, 30 dBm, that's one watt. Zero dBm is one milliwatt. And minus 30 is one microwatt, minus 60 is one nano, and minus 90 is one picowatt. Now, usually around minus 90 is the sensitivity limits on the uh, on typical sort of um, Bluetooth radios. And maybe we should bring up the NRF Connect desktop again. Let's see, where did my card go? Just to show you no, that's not gonna work. I need a USB cable. Hang on a second. Okay, let's see if this works. Yes, excellent. So what you're looking at now is the 2.4 gigahertz radio spectrum. And on the left side here, you can see the dBm scale. So that massive bump that you just saw, that's probably my Wi-Fi router. Now my Wi-Fi router is upstairs, so it's not very close. But you can see that not much here actually goes that high. If you're seeing high things like uh, minus 30 dBm, it's the phone I have in my hand that is only a few centimeters away from the, uh, from the uh, dev kit. And now if we go back to the table, and look at minus 30 dBm, that's one microwatt. <laughs> that's not a lot of energy. So 
the fundamental problem I have with RF har ambient RF harvesting is that most of the systems I've seen that actually work, they set up a transmitter specifically to harvest energy. Now, one of the systems was from Airfuel, uh, Airfuel RF, I think, well, there was a Bluetooth company that had some receivers also. And we're talking, they're transmitting maybe 30 dBm or even higher, 36 dBm, because that's the maximum if you're running sub gig, sub gigahertz. And then on the RX side, you're harvesting maybe 10 microwatts or 20 microwatts or some, some insanely small number. So the fundamental problem I have with harvesting ambient RF is that it's extremely wasteful. So at sub gigahertz, you're losing a thousand percent, or not a thousand percent, you're down to a thousandth of the uh, energy. So minus 30 dB, this is 10 log, at one meter. For 2.4, it's more like 10,000. So there's a vanishingly small amount of power there. And using it specifically uh, with a transmitter and the receiver is an insane amount of waste. Now, I'm making one assumption, and that is that the antenna is rem relatively sort of uh, omnidirectional on both sides. Now, if you can make directional antennas, well, then it probably vastly improves. And at some point, maybe you can make a maser or a laser and it'll be okay. But then if you're transmitting a watt at 2.4 gigahertz uh, uh, in sort of a very tight coherent beam, then maybe I don't want to be in that room because, well, it's a watt, but, and it probably is okay but it's the same frequency that is running in my microwave. It, it won't damage my cells, it'll just heat them up. But anyway, yeah, I don't like RF harvesting. If you have to work on ambient RFing, RF harvesting, then hopefully you work on the antennas, trying to make them directional or something like that. Maybe, it's, maybe you can use a MIMO system to sort of target a sensor node to give it some energy. And that makes sense. I don't know. Yeah. Anyway, I think it's a stupid idea. One last one that was... Well, this is relatively new. I, I've not seen this before. It's a couple of years ago. And that is actually taking advantage of static electricity. So as we walk around, as we interact with the environment, we pick up electrons. That's why when you touch your door or when you touch your, um, what's it called, the uh, trolley that you're in your grocery shop, you touch that, then you can sort of feel the zap, right? That's energy. There is electrons there. Now, maybe we can harvest that triboelectric energy. The triboelectric energy comes in form of an AC source, and it's basically a AC coupled AC source. I don't know if why I had the capacitor there. Anyway, the uh, paper that I found on triboelectric energy harvesting is actually uh, a Creative Commons, so that you can just download and read, and it's pretty cool because it had nice pictures. So the principle is that you have some sort of sensor that is very, what's the word? Very sensitive? That easily generates a difference in electrons when you rub them in terms of friction. So that's our sensor, our uh, harvesting uh, source. But then we need a circuit. So the, well, in this case, I think, it, yeah, it's a temperature uh, thing. It's a temperature um, system. The temperature system? <laughs> it is a temperature sensor that uses energy harvesting. And the uh, less than one hertz human emotion. Uh, human emotion, not emotion. That'd be cool. So <clears throat> one of the key concepts in this paper is a low leakage rectifier that turns this triboelectric energy 
or the uh, difference in electrons into a voltage. Now, the voltage from these triboelectric systems can actually be quite high, but you can't pull a lot of power. So you need some sort of uh, storage device. And in this case, when you have enough energy in the system, then it'll do a one-shot temperature measurement. And that's what they're trying to illustrate here. We have the uh, rectifier bridge. It is putting the charge into a storage capacitor. At some point, the, the system is enabled. So there's a switch in here. There's a very sort of static, low-power system. It powers up a band gap that you know how to make now based on the previous lectures and you have a reference you have some sort of I guess a p -tet current and at a certain point the comparator will trigger which gives a well in this case let's see VDDL where's VDDL PMU output so <clears throat> we get the temperature sensor turning on and how long the pulse is depends on... Now, there's, there's the temperature output. That's the one. How long the pulse is will depend on temperature because when it goes low, it turns on. But when it's... Because that's the switch turning on and then it goes low again. No, sorry, it goes high, high again when the comparator triggers. So that's when the PTEC current has charged the capacitor to the VREF voltage. So, ah, cool. It's pretty cool that they've actually been able to run it on triboelectric uh, harvesting. So, in the end, there are many different ways of harvesting energy from our environment. But it should now be obvious that you cannot make one circuit to fit them all you actually have to pick. So if your boss comes and he says, make me an energy harvesting system, your answer should be, okay, what's it gonna be used for? Which environment? What's the use case? Is it indoor, is it outdoor? Is there, well, don't use RF energy. <laughs> I'm probably going to get comments on that, but I don't like RF or ambient RF harvesting. Uh, is there a thermal gradient? Uh, is there vibrations that you can leverage? Is there this triboelectric energy? Now, the triboelectric is really, really low current, but maybe the key point I want to make today is that, as you can see, when we're talking indoor or we're talking sort of the um, the, therm the thermoelectric generators or piezoelectric or triboelectric, it's not a lot of power. It's microwatts per cubic centimeter. Uh, cubic centimeter. That means that the most important thing you can do in order to make it easy to harvest is to bring the current consumption of our electronic circuits down. Today, we are extremely wasteful with our energy. In the digital circuits, we are charging the gate capacitors of the, while well, we're charging the next <laughs> digital logic to VDD, and then we're dumping that charge to ground, and that consumes energy. In the analog circuits, we are placing a constant current all over the place, and we're consuming energy. So bringing that energy down as far as we can go is really the key in order to get energy harvesting to really work. Now, I want to make sort of a interesting point, I think. Back in, let's see. So I've linked in, in the lecture notes um, a history of data converters from Walter Kester. And I think on page, let me download this so it's uh, slightly faster. And on page 24, there we go. No, that's not that's not it. That one. Yes, this is the one I wanted. On page 24, we have the world's first commercial analog to digital converter. This was a, I believe this was a successor approximation ADC. So pretty standard to, to, uh, <laughs> topology or architecture, but it's made with vacuum tubes. It was running at 50 kilo samples per second. 
and it was consuming 500 watts. If you do the same thing today, we are talking, well, let's see. So if we can compute the figure of merit of that, uh, the uh, day track, then it's four microjoules per conversion step. And today we're down to 0.6 femtojoules per conversion step. So that's a billion times or almost 10 billion times less energy. Now, I don't think we can go a 10 billion times more then we're, I think then we're into different types of electronics, spintronics or whatever the uh, next generation of stuff is gonna be. But we can still make low power stuff. I mean, our transistors has have a fantastic amount of dynamic range. It's maybe five orders of magnitude from nano or pico amps to um, milliamps. So, the best thing you can do in order to make sort of a, the uh, battery-less IoT uh, world a reality is to reduce the current consumption of your le electronic circuits, all of them. Now, a key concept that is maybe important to note is that what we're talking about when it comes to energy harvesting is the average current consumption. Because if you only do something once a day or every day or every 10 days or every month, or if you do things very seldom, most of your electronic circuit will be turned off. And then the key is how low can you go in the average current consumption? Because if you can get the average current consumption really, really low, below a microwatt, then you can actually once in a while, wake up, do something, and use a lot more energy, exactly as they did in this temperature sensor. You're harvesting for a long time until it's high enough, and then you're doing something. If you do that and get the always on or the average current consumption down, then our fantastic world of IoT battery-less sensors might become a reality. So have a look in the lecture notes. If you have questions, comment in the um, comments below and then like and subscribe and all that stuff. And uh, have a fantastic day.